good morning, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are in the world today. My name's Paul Webb, I'm the founder of B2B Energy, and you are listening to Energy Speaks Back. Energy Speaks Back interviews energy experts from around the world. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to episode 33 of Energy Speaks Back. Weekly, I present to you experts from around the world, and today we are in the heat of the UAE, and I'm interviewing an energy expert who I've met on my global energy expert journey. Our purpose, as always, is to provide a good understanding of energy management knowledge from around the world, which is available today for us to deliver savings that impact on our planet. My guest today is an energy expert, an indoor air quality specialist, and an advisor. So without any further ado, I give you Sunil Hanel. Good morning, Sunil, uh, or should I be saying good afternoon, Sunil, to you? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And how are you today? I'm absolutely fine. And you're obviously in Dubai, and I don't want to ask what the temperatures are there. Well, it is. it would be touching around 40 to 41 degrees at this point of time, you know, really hot. Wow. And it is going to go up further. Really? Yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm sitting in nine degrees at the moment, Sonny. Oh. So, <laughs> do you know what nine degrees feels like? Oh, yes, I can understand that. I have seen it, but then, you know, not felt it so far, you know. Yeah, maybe once in once or twice in lifetime, it probably Dubai when it dropped to around seven or eight degrees or so, something like that. That right. was once or twice. That's right. Yeah, but yeah, then we were indoors at those those days. You know, so yeah, you, we could feel that. Yes. Yeah, I remember seeing a comedian talking about his holidays in Dubai, and he said it was like opening the oven, <laughs> going outside into the oven. Absolutely. True. And I've done some work in Qatar, and that was very hot. And I I found myself sleeping every afternoon because it was just so hot. I couldn't cope with it. But you get used to it, don't you? You do get no, used but to it. I I would tell you one thing, my experience when uh, the only five-star resort in uh, whole of Gulf was being constructed, it was way back in 2008-2009, which is called as the Qasr al Sarab, And it is almost like, you know, 150 kilometers away from Abu Dhabi, the other emirate. And in this particular, uh, this was a nine-month project from construction to finish. And we had a very, almost around 10,000 people working in that particular project. And being a project director for the ELB subsystems, believe me, we were working in desert at a temperature of 52 degrees, running like, I mean, wow. sweating like pigs, working 17, 18 hours a day just to meet the deadlines. The yeah. reason for that being 50 50,000 dirhams to 100,000 dirhams was a fine per day during those days. And with us, with us, with, with my own uh, staff of around 150 people, it was a real challenge. But 52 degrees, probably one would really find it very, very difficult. So that's, the, that's the thing which we experienced here. But anyway, having said that, it is one of the best places. It doesn't become too cold. But it is during hot summer, is it? Yes, three, four months, a bit tight. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. That I mean, you've been here for the last 27, uh, for the last 30 years. So it doesn't really matter much. This is my first home or second home, you can say, other than, other than Mumbai. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Sunil, uh, it's amazing. I'd love to hear more about the, the these high temperatures and what you're working on in Dubai. But give some background to yourself. We've met through the, the Global Energy Experts program that I've been running and we've had quite a few seminars. I've never actually had a one-to-one to with you. And I'm really pleased that, you know, we've had some chats offline, which is really great. But tell us some background about yourself. Absolutely. No, you are absolutely correct. We came across uh, global energy uh, experts. But then, yeah, to start off with, uh, I am basically a research assistant working, was working in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. And this was a research of... Uh, basically identifying pulses from the celestial objects using photo, photo tubes. It was way back in 83, 86. So we both worked at that level where electronics was being, you know, 
we used to design the the hardware units using ICs and using programs, Fortran programs, and then went on to the machine language. So that was my starting point after my graduation. So being a research assistant for three, three and a half years, I had to come back and work on the mainframe computer. So started off as a, as a, as a engineer, customer engineer in 89 and worked in that mainframe region, uh, working on huge computers, which were as big as one, one big room. Those were the days working on software, hardware, predominantly hardware and software was also part of it because it was from the research. I picked it up from the research uh, uh, faculty. So it was nice. And then uh, late, then you know, around 94, 95, they started off with networking. When, when AT&T actually was a pioneer in networking in 94, 95, and that's how we started off, constructed a lot of uh, networks uh, infrastructure as well as uh, LAN networks during those days. And this I'm talking in India. Now, yeah. during that, we did go, I was involved as a, a senior engineer for working Citibank uh, UAE with around uh, three more people as my assistants to manage all the Citibank uh, computer operations uh, in whole of UAE. And when then I got shifted to Oman for another one and a half year, uh, working for the same company called CMS Computers in Mumbai, where we were managing 33 locations, branches of National Bank of Oman, uh, with all those ATMs and huge Perkin Elmer systems and PCs. And so that was the background when we started. Then networking started, and I focused on the networking using FDDI networks, using Ether networks, you know. So those were the things. It was until 95 to 97 where we actually constructed the biggest network of, I would say, during those days of India using the FDDI network where on fiber in way back in 93, 94. Right. Yeah, around that time. So then we worked on that. And then I felt, no, it was because I had tested the Gulf waters and it was fetching me very good uh, revenue. Apart. So I decided why not go and uh, honestly, to be on the personal side, there was a bit of reluctance from my family because I did get an opportunity to go to US in 98, 99 as uh, oh. a hardware engineer for major for mainframe systems, which my father really opposed saying that, no, you're not going to go. And then when <laughs> I got an opportunity in Saudi Arabia, my wife opposed, no, you're not going to go. <laughs> And fine, so this is how I had to respect the family uh, yeah, yeah. decisions. And then uh, luckily, you know, we were blessed with a daughter. Oh. And uh, then I said, no, she is there. Now I find, let me, let me just try it out, you know. And luckily, the place where I, I, the place where I had actually applied for, believe me, I, my brother had come to, to UAE and he forgot to post my CV. Okay, fair enough. He post forgot. So I, uh, while he was moving back to India for a short duty, he came, he was here for about 30 days. On the 27th day or 28th day, he posted the CVs. And within one day, I got a call that Sunil, we want you to come. We want you to interview you. I said, fair enough. So that's how I got my job in a company called Telematics, where I had visited and I stayed here for two days. But then again, I went back to India, I did completed all my formalities, existing formalities. So I came to UAE. Because basically I was selected on my uh, knowledge on hardware design for infrastructure and ether networks, right. the networking basically. And here the first project we did was a Dubai financial market, which was coming up during those days and Acer Middle East, which was quite good. So we started off with that and around 2002 or 2001, we actually worked, started working, my company started working on ELV infrastructure which was the new buildings coming up and networking was coming up. So we pitched up a fiber network for a whole resort, even running fire systems on the fire network, fiber network. This was way back in 2001. And uh, yes, uh, it was a UK company called Gent, which was involved in that. And when, yes. I, when we did talk about the how to communicate the fire signals, because fire signals, you have a special rating of fire cable. Unfortunately, during those days, they used to run multi-mode fiber cable. I don't know if you're aware of the fiber cables. So they didn't, and we were running single mode fiber cable. So they developed special transceivers to communicate on single mode. So it was a good experience 
to work on that project. And then from there, we worked for major hospitality projects all over the Gulf for about 12 years. During this recession of around 2009-89, we actually, since we were the nominated contractors or nominated system integrators for ELB, uh, we came, our profits, our revenue started shrinking because it was a scenario worldwide. So then we decided how to, what do we do? And because we were in the ELV, ELV system, we really felt that we, mean, we were involved in a lot of installation of building management systems during those days, audiovisual, data networking, CCTV. So many systems were combined on one information highway, which was a fiber network. So that was really good. And that really led us to think that there's so much of energy wasted in these hospitality projects, because during those days, if I want to, even somebody sitting on, oh, I want a very cold environment. So I would cut, cut down the temperature, the thermostat to 19 degrees, 18 degrees. Yeah. If, so, and there was, and I used to, when people used to go away from there. So we saw there was a tremendous loss of energy. We could see it, even water was being wasted. So then we decided and let us get shift from, shifted from system integration to something very niche, which is energy management. So in 2011, I, along with my all uh, my senior uh, 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 officials from my previous company called Telematics, we started a company which was dedicated on energy management completely. And this was in the year 2011. And we started this company with two basic principles. We were doing pretty good in whole of the Gulf and, and, and within UAE were probably number two, if not number one, with telematics, with the kind of projects we had done. So we started with two principles saying that, first of all, we will not attack or we will not take any of the telematics customers into Magenta. It would have been very easy for us, fairly easy for us to start off something which was, you were on a pedestal, correct? As a senior people. So that was the first principle we took. The other principle we decided was we are not going to porch anybody or ask anybody from uh, telematics to join Magenta. So we were at the senior level, people were intending, people were requesting us. But since it was a policy decision, we took that. And believe me, it was a new, it was a total niche area where there was no company known for energy management during 2011 in whole of UAE, for that matter in Gulf. So we started off with that and we had a really, really uphill task in explaining people what is energy management. And we could really find that nobody was really bothered. People used to get the electricity bills, water bills, they used to just pay whatever they used to get during those days without even understanding why I'm paying so much. So then we decided why not give them a view of whatever they are consuming? Because if you cannot, like today, a financial, not even today, even yesteryears, finance people actually see what is the revenue coming in and how much you're spending. And that's how they calculate, okay, this has been the profit and we need to use in a judicious way. So here people were not even aware how much they are consuming. So we decided to work on a device which could help us to connect the legacy device and monitor the energy consumption. So Sonia, when you're talking about the uh, looking at their data, was you creating devices to monitor their systems or to control their systems? Well, it was basically monitoring first because there was no idea what people are consuming throughout the day. Excellent. So we created a device and we, since we were technology based, we wanted to go with GSM right from the day one. So we created a device, we basically got hold of a device and we got it made and also made a web base because these things were kind of, you know, not available or not commonly heard of. So yeah. yes, it did take some time. And after pitching it to the clients where we could make even, I'm sorry to say the best of the hotels with one of the great director, director of engineering, even they don't, didn't know what is energy management. Yeah. So this was the case, obviously, with due respect to everybody's, because it was just evolving field at that point of time. So we created uh, this device and we actually showed people we were monitoring on uh, every minute basis and we could produce those trends, those graphs, and we could see the sweet spots that the equipment was functioning when it was not supposed to be functioning. So that was a potential opportunity for savings. This is when we actually pointed out by reading those graphs, by analyzing the data, because we had to analyze the data to make the people understand 
So that's how we went ahead. We created the, the, uh, the kind of infrastructure for people to understand. So now they understood. And it was nice that people could understand. And that's how we actually deep dive into energy management with Magenta. With first of our clients coming almost around, I would say around eight to nine months after we created Magenta. It was a it was a tough time, but that's that's a... I wouldn't say it's a brief background, but it is a background. Which no, you know what? I, I really like the way you built that up because, um, you know, I, I like to understand people's origin. And your origin it has been the technical side, uh, the network side, and you've brought that all the way into the, the monitoring side. And for me, I love monitoring. I think it's really <laughs> key and important that we feed back the visibility on, on buildings to organisations. And it's interesting... So I've done, we mentioned before, I've done some work in uh, Qatar. And I said to them about their bills, their energy bills, and are they monitoring their energy? And you're right, they're not. It was a big hotel. Um, they wasn't monitoring their electricity or their uh, gas consumption. And when I asked why, they said, well, we don't really pay for our electricity and gas. The more the, the precious utility there is water, as we know. However, we are still creating emissions by using electricity and gas. So we should be focusing, whether we're paying for it or not, we should have that mindset to be reducing it. And I'm, I've sensed that that isn't the case in your, you know, in UAE um, across the board for businesses. Is that right? Very correct. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And what happens is I... Uh, we are monitoring now. Obviously, we started off with electrical monitoring. The same device we actually had, uh, we could monitor with the gases, with the with the the with the gas consumption, the oil consumption, the water consumption. So basically, one hardware, one software, and you can monitor the whole facility with that particular device. So this was obviously it was evolving. So we had to really reconstruct. So it has been really nice. And off late, honestly speaking. You know, with the kind of pe mindset people have that we have to reduce the energy consumption, there are technicians, there are people who do not understand that just by switching off the device does not help you saving consumption. On the contrary, it really affects you as far as because you are spending a lot of time indoors, it affects you in the air quality. So it, there was a common procedure, people used to just switch it off rather than controlling. And so to such an extent where AHUs and FHUs was uh, shut off because they were running on fans and outdoor energy, we had to, a lot of energy was consumed to cool down the air, to condition the air. Yeah. And that's where we actually found, uh, Paul, that energy and indoor air quality are interrelated because it was affecting the quality of air because of the switching off of the AHUs. Right. And that's how we started focusing on the indoor air quality for the last, I think in 2015, we actually started off and today we are able to tell the clients that please you save the energy, but at the same time, keep monitoring the health of your indoor infrastructure, especially the air, which can cause a lot of absenteeism to, to your office staff or maybe at your home also. Yeah. So, so that is you, something, these are interrelated. Yeah. Do you, um, how granular does your system go? So I, I look at a lot of half hourly data. So I like to look at top end part first i don't look at the the secondary metering side do you does your system enable you to go really granular into the plant energy yes very correct now obviously it all depends we offer the we offer monitoring at one minute every one minute and our system keeps on refreshing it every one minute so you know exactly what is your consumption during one minute because i i, I just to give you one or two examples we had a monitoring system involved and there were a couple of hotels in UAE which were facing in a particular area which were facing a problem that all of a sudden their uh, systems around 7.30, 8 o'clock, 7.30 to 7.35 we used to switch off and they by the time the generator kicks in they had to waste a lot of time because you know by the time generator kicks in the software has to be enabled so a lot of difficulties were there so when yeah. we actually monitored we could find out that there was a spike coming into the system, which was affecting and shutting down the main system and, and kicking in the emergency system. Right. So when we actually went into that and we gave that data for every minute, 
that's how they went to the utility and told them that there's a problem initially because the utility was an authority they refused it but right. over a target of or over a, over a period of five four to five months after continuously talking and continuously giving them the data they could actually realize no there was a problem and in believe me in one of the distribution uh, buildings where the electricity was being distributed one of the relay was chattering and that was affecting number of buildings so right. that granularity i mean if you say it's it's when you talk of granularity it is one minute but then yes we have developed a lot of uh, you know predictive maintenance kind of things which yes. could help clients you know so that was that was that is the answer to the granularity we believe the same thing in air quality also so we monitor every air quality in every one minute it keeps on updating because unless and until you have the detailed data you may not use it but if you have a detailed data why not make use of it yeah yeah it, yeah so you go real time monitoring i would call that where you're monitoring something real time um but the the maintenance manager or the facilities manager doesn't have to look at it every minute of the day he can get the alerts maybe at the end of the day which is key you know what we don't want to be doing is keep firing in messages all day you're using more energy here you're using you know energy in this area so we don't want to do that we need to sort of like manage the data so it's great having all this real-time stuff and granular right down to the the, the end plant but we do need to manage that to the next level regarding day plus one or weekly reporting. Okay. I understand what you're saying there. And, and have you stepped into the control side or just purely monitoring? Very, very, very limited way. Right. Because what happens is every facility is unique by itself. Yeah. So the control modules are separate. The control modules, whatever they are looking at is separate. And today there are so many devices available from the manufacturers that they are able to do that. So for us to make a control, yes, but yes, as far as HVAC control is concerned, especially in the guest rooms, we deploy smart Wi-Fi thermostats to automatically monitor and control them. But yeah. on the major consumption, equipment consumption, normally we don't uh, do that unless and, uh, unless and unless it's specifically required. But we still recommend them to go to the original manufacturers because they can support it. We can only suggest. But so we haven't, we are more focused on real time monitoring and providing suggesting solutions. It depends on the client's budget, how to go with it rather yeah. than supplying the solutions. You know, We strongly it, believe monitoring is better. And I, again, I find that very refreshing because you're you become a master of the monitoring side of it, um, and that's what we need in this industry. We need people to be narrow-minded, focusing on the sections, and then collaborating with maybe a BMS expert or a building management expert to actually then focus on those other areas, which was which is where their expertise is. Yes. Now, so. Definitely. I class myself as a BMS expert. I work for Trend, now Honeywell, Satchwell, Schneider. So then 16 years, and, and I could say 20 years in that industry, I've got a really good knowledge of building management. Hmm. I have got some knowledge of the control side, the monitoring side, but I remember in them days when we were inst installing uh, monitoring on, on, on the energy, we struggled. We just couldn't get it accurate enough. <laughs> you know, and that's where we had to bring the experts in for for metering. So we wasn't we was experts in control, not in the monitoring of the system. No, I've got a good <laughs> overview of it, but not the detail. So no, I would call upon the experts. No, definitely control is a different ball game because you need to go into the details of the device. And and today, honestly speaking, there are experts available. So why reinvent the wheel? I mean, that's our thought process. To be very honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. And how many systems would you say you're monitoring in the UAE? Oh, in the past 11 years, if I talk about the facilities, there are plenty of facilities. Yeah, yeah. Let me just give you one example. You are in UK, correct? Yes. In 2014, if I, or 14 or 15, obviously the system was known and luckily it so happened that uh, there's a company called TDM in UK. And they heard about Magenta Systems doing real-time monitoring. So what happened is a station called Derby Station, railway station, they wanted to monitor the consumption for 
for because they're, 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 these are given to the operators. I believe the services are given to the operators who actually operate. So basically, they took our monitoring system and utilized it for one complete year to monitor how was the energy being uh, used during the weekends, during the morning hours, peak hours, during the off hours. So they, they could actually cut down the consumption for one railway station. So it was a study for them. Apart from this, and it was a plug in ours is a plug and play device. You really don't need to do anything. If you have a local GSM SIM, put in the local GSM SIM, put some CDs and that's it. Similarly, yeah. in Saudi Arabia, we did, it was just a device we sent. Nobody has to really go. And you just configure it within 45 to 50 minutes, the data is up and running. So yeah. if you really go to see good number of customers, we have overseas customers as well. And today we have entered into the research department where we are actually not only doing facility monitoring, but you are, we are doing actually circuit-based monitoring, individual electrical circuit-based. Not only that, research people are talking to drop the, draw the data directly using Modbus, which we are able to help them out with the solutions. So yeah, if you really go to see, there are plenty of things, you know. Yeah, and eleven years I feel is a good time uh, <laughs> to collect. Yeah, no, I've been discussing this recently. Uh, anything over ten years in business, I think that's uh, rewardable. It's uh, it's it's good. Yeah. Um, can I ask? So your products and the services you provide, do you do this globally, or are you just doing it in the UAE? I I did get your question. Sorry. Sorry. You... Are you doing this across the world? This, no, this technology? our focus is basically in the Gulf and Middle East countries. No, we are not going away. Yes, India has been the focus, but uh, not so much, you know, but because we can be sitting in Gulf and Middle East, we can actually control and we can really go out very quickly because the, the, the airlines are available and it is not a long distance that we have to travel. But yeah. normally we don't travel and uh, we try to focus our attention only on the Gulf and Middle East countries, you know. Right. And would you have the appetite long term to become global? Many, many people have have taken them steps. Yes, we, we do intend, we do intend to do that, definitely, but not in the near future compared to what we have seen last one and a half, two years. You yeah. know, it's it's basically reconsolidation and consolidating yourself because yeah. definitely we do intend the idea was to go further down, but then these two years have been quite tough for every business. Yeah. So that may probably put a hold uh, or, or delay the, the intent. Exactly. It's, I've gone the reverse, but I don't have a technology to, um, to consider. Because obviously when you've got uh, technology, you've got manufacturing, you've then got transport of that technology. It then starts to become a different story if you're trying to ship that around the world. Um, but service-wise, I can ship my service anywhere. You know, I can become online. So it's easier for me to become global. And right. I, I like um, the sound of the technology and what you've done there. Um, I think there's opportunities to take that globally because there's, we need technology available to go and deliver that. And I know there's many, many technologies out there, but you, you've spent many years proving that technology in that sort of environment. And when we talk about environment, are you niching in the hospitality sector? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. It is very, very critical. Absolutely. It is very critical. And I, we, are, we are basically, let me just tell you, it's good that you told me we are also, our basic uh, intent was to go into service industry. But then when we provided a service doing data analytics and all, then people asked, what about the solution? Okay, we understand what you are doing. Mm. But we need the solution. So we had to divert that because what happens after giving services, what they, where does the customer go? So that's how we actually went into solution pro provision as well. Now, mm. as far as the environment and hospital, we basically consider four sectors, medical, education, hospitality, and data centers. Right. So this has been our focus area. Obviously, we have not gone into commercial building. Commercial buildings, yes, as they keep on coming, we do intend. But otherwise, we are focusing very, very deeply focused on these areas, basically, these sectors, you know. And hospitality is a place where it's a good uh, opportunity. But yes, uh, it, would, it would take some more time to develop, uh, to, to come up with, with the current pandemic situation. It is really sad state, you know, very yeah. sad. But yeah, this, is how, this is how the life is. But the hospital. 
hospitality sector has been devastated by this, hasn't it? Um, by the uh, pandemic, because obviously we're not allowed to stay out away. But I, I do some work for a, a, a hotel group, and we are now seeing increases in occupation, especially during the week at the moment. But over the next couple of weeks, that's going to start expanding. And I think we will probably find in the summer, because of the traveling restrictions, many, many people were going to be staying in the UK and not traveling so much. So again, the hotels are going to be uh, inundated possibly and their, their occupation period is going to go up. Um, it's not just going to be about business, it's going to be about holiday makers as well, staying in these areas. Absolutely. And here in the Gulf countries now, this is the holy month of Ramadan going on. So right. businesses, as it is low during the Eid, it might pick up. But one good thing which is happening in this part of the world, I am sure you would be aware that Expo was to happen last year, Expo 2020. Yes. And now that has been shifted from, from 2020 to 1st of October 2021. Right. So we do expect a good buoyancy, good amount of travelers coming in. They are really gearing up for it. And we can see the positivity in these markets, you know. With the with the hotels, the way they are, to, they are as it is. I mean, though the restrictions were lifted by UAE government by airlines, five uh, by seventh of July last year. But now we can see good amount of people coming in. But at mm. the same time, because of this pandemic, a lot of people have gone back to their own home states. You know, so that's yeah. that's a that's a kind of a catchy situation. But I'm sure still three months, four months to go, five months to go. Definitely, we are going to be in a in a kind of a very positive environment, absolutely positive environment with Expo 2021 coming up in, in Dubai. And will you be presenting there, your company? Well, uh, is, is, uh, we're still in, in, in talks with some people, but presently the Expo buildings are being made and all. So those are going ahead. But as far as currently there are no plans, but we are in talk with some sub companies as such. So let right. us see how it goes through. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. these decisions have to be thoughtful, you know. Yeah, and also we've got the uh, the World Cup is coming in Qatar soon, Qatar. isn't it? That's right, absolutely. It will be more focused in Qatar. So all the world, once this is done, obviously it will be World Cup is coming in Qatar in in October in October or November twenty. Correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. So by then, uh, I've lost I've lost track of the timing of it. Um, uh, I sure no no issue. But then the thing is, this expo is going to continue for six continuous months. And right. they are targeting more than 20 million people just yeah. traveling in Dubai. Wow. And you will not believe in this kind of tough situation. There are 20 new hotels, five-star hotels, which have come up last year. Just oh, because without of it. any. Absolutely. That's absolutely. amazing. You have to make the infrastructure available. Otherwise, how do you, like, I'm sorry to say, see, uh, again, I just a little bit digress from here. You see the condition of India today. Yes. Because they never thought about the infrastructure to be created within the four or five months they got. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but then, you know, this is a fact. And one has to accept the fact. So if you think of the infrastructure and you expect people, 20 million people to come in, obviously you will not have difficulty. Yeah. So, yes, now there is a tough time. They would be facing a tough time. But ultimately, yes, it is going to be helpful to them. Yeah. Um, Sunil, um, I like to put all my guests on the spot. I can see you smiling now. <laughs> <laughs> so is there something that you can give back to the industry today um, from your knowledge as a takeaway for everyone? Well, I what I would say is, I mean, I, I'm not too sure if you're following my LinkedIn post on Facebook or Twitter, but I'm a passionate guy. Absolutely passionate. We actually started off something from a different field. I started from way back from research field and I have traveled. So energy is something which is very passionate for me. I'm very passionate about energy. So what I strongly feel is if my if our services can be best utilized in how to conserve the energy, not only for electricity, but for water, for and also improve the indoor air quality. And if those that information, the experience which we have gathered, if that can be utilized in in way of uh, in terms of talking to people in webinars, how you can actually uh, training some people, you know, that is the best way. Yes, business is on one side, but you need to educate people, bring the awareness, and I'm ready to do that. To be very honest, because that would really help. If I can, my 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 wife is a teacher from last thirty years. 
and I have seen her. Obviously, I've been, been 20, uh, 25 years that we have been married for. I have seen her 25 years, how passionate she is about uh, teaching students. And similarly for me, if I can help in talking to people about energy and how to manage it, because everybody does not know how to do it. If they go out in the market, it will be costing them money. So if the services could be utilized in a better way on the basics front, then that could help and it could save our, our mother earth for the future generation. And if I could be helpful, I could be helpful and play my part for that, I would love to do that. Not only for the energy, but also to help on understanding what are the important things for air quality as well, because we are indoors all the time. Yeah. And they are, you cannot separate environment. You have to be passionate about environment. People are not bothered because people just don't have time to think about it. Yeah. That's so if I, if I that's the one thing I would like to love and I would like to give back uh, in whatever way I can. Brilliant. So that's absolutely amazing. You're, you're singing off the same page as myself. That's exactly what I want to be doing is providing my knowledge back 40 years of, of my experience back into the industry. And that's exactly what you want to do. You want to give that back, your energy management, everything you've learned in, in the technical side. Um, you're, you're, as I say, you're, you're on the same page as me. And I really like that and really welcome that. And I think that's amazing what you've uh, just put over there. And that's brilliant. Um, Daniel, it's been a real pleasure. I've, I've wasted so much time having you on all these seminars I've been talking to. And I've wished I'd I've seen you out the corner of my eye there and I've, we should have spent more time. We will spend more time talking to each other. So, so I know it's been a, a real pleasure having you on the show um, and listening to your background and your expertise. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Paul. For It's an honor for me for, to talk to you on this. Obviously, yes, as you said, we had never, never had an opportunity, but really wonderful and pleasure talking to you. Thank you for your time as well. I really appreciate it. And you and your family, Sunil, please be safe, yeah? Thank you. Thank you, sure, definitely. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening today. And thank you to my special guest. And if you want to know more about managing your third largest expense, please go to our website on b2benergy.co.uk. That leaves me with one more thing to say. Be safe.